Thank you for the kind introduction and, um, and asking me to speak today at this conference. I'll be speaking about ventilatory management of severe BPD in our experience. We care for approximately 50 patients a year over the last 10 years. Sorry, um, and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, objectives today will be to apply principles of physiology to ventilator management in severe BPD, explain how we identify the phenotype of an individual patient, and then how we help that guide our ventilator management, and describe why we shift from an acute to chronic care management strategy for patients with severe BPD. So briefly, um, it's I think you all know that men, most infants with extreme prematurity will develop BPD. Overall, approximately 40% of infants, which has been stable rates over the last few decades. There are a number of, of definitions of BPD available. Um, I think to define the population I'll be speaking about today, I'll use Eric Jensen's definition, one of my colleagues in our program, who developed a modern outcomes-based definition of BPD using a retrospective cohort of patients from the Neonatal Research Network you can see had significant rates of death, serious respiratory morbidity, and or developmental impairments. And he developed 18 pre-specified severity graded definitions to see how they could accurately predict later outcomes. One of them was the, NIH, the existing NIH definition, used a number of factors in a regression model. And the optimal BPD definition was the one that produced the highest C statistic for predicting late death or serious respiratory morbidity. This is the optimal defi definition of BPD that was the best predictor of the composite study outcomes. It took away the need to assess the 28 days of oxygen therapy and was based on the mode of support at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, which was irrespective of oxygen level. Grade 1 BPD is, is um, an infant that's on nasal cannula of, of equal or less than 2 liters per minute. Grade two is greater than two liters or CPAP for nasal intermittent positive pressure ventilation. And then grade three BPD is an infant who's mechanically ventilated. In terms of the rates by severity grade, about approximately 30% of patients will have what we call severe BPD. And those will be the patients that I'm speaking of today. Now, while a number of patients with grade two, two BPD will be on non-invasive support at 36 weeks, a proportion of these will go on to need mechanical ventilation later in time. And we use the same strategies for those patients. Looking at the outcome rates by severity, you can see that patients with grade two and, and substantially higher in grade three BPD have significant rates of death, morbidity, and neurodevelopmental impairments. And in looking at the outcome of death between 36 weeks and follow-up, you can see that grade 3 BPD is much higher than the other grades. Looking at respiratory outcomes by severity, again, you can see the pattern for grade 3 BPD, much higher rates of needing tracheostomy, hospitalization beyond 50 weeks for respiratory reasons, supplemental oxygen at follow-up, ventilator at follow-up, respiratory monitor use at follow-up. And so I think showing hopefully the significant um, chronic nature of this disease, I, I'm hoping to explain why we must move from our acute care approach that Dr. Bancalari just described so beautifully into a chronic care approach. And so when, you know, when, when babies are first born, we target a lower tidal volume or pressure. We mean the ventilator support as much as we can. We frequent, frequent blood gases to guide this weaning and we want to excavate as soon as possible. Now, when a patient meets the definition of severe BPD, we really do need to frame shift in our mind the reality that we now have a significant chronic disease and we have to adjust our approach to the ventilator. So we increase our pressure limit to achieve our gold tidal volumes. We wean maybe once a week. We get infrequent blood gases as the patient exam is just as meaningful to guide the settings. And in fact, we may intubate an infant who is failing to thrive on non-invasive support. So our global aim in ventilator management is to support the whole baby. And what do we mean by adequately supporting the whole baby? We have the lungs, but also the heart, neurodevelopment and growth. 
And when we're looking to see if we're adequately supporting, we're not only, I mean, as I mentioned, we don't really get frequent blood gases. We're looking at vital signs. We're looking at episodic saturations, but also can the baby participate in activities of daily living? Are they able to do anything other than lie in the crib? Are they having quiet awake periods? Can they handle cares? What happens when they ask them to sit up or participate in therapies? And in order to support the heart, we have to support the lungs. If we under support the lungs, we inevitably see significant pulmonary hypertension develop. And if we don't support the lungs and the heart, then the baby can't participate in developmental therapies and as well as, um, as grow. And we look measurably at the bedside of weight and linear growth. And if we are inadequately supporting the baby, we'll actually see the continued weight gain, but linear growth will fall off. And so we use length boards to measure these babies once a week. And what we can't measure, but is just as essential, is the somatic growth. So the alveolarization, and ongoing with the vasculature that's so essential. And so this means that we often will increase settings as the disease evolves. We think of BPD in terms of phenotypes and these are data out of our program. Um, and so the buckets that we place are lung parenchymal disease, which can be both homogeneous and heterogeneous, more commonly heterogeneous. And you can see in a CT scan on the right, the heterogeneity of the disease there. Airway disease that is both large and small airway disease. The small airway disease often has an obstructive and reactive component to it, as well as pulmonary vascular disease as a result of vascular pruning and remodeling, which can include both pulmonary arterial hypertension as well as pulmonary venous obstructive disease. And so we use a number of different modalities to try and identify the different phenotype for a different baby, which include bronchoscopy, CT scans, ventilator graphics, group think, kind of cardiography. Pulmonary hypertension is common in severe BPD. They have abnormal vascular growth function and structure due to impaired alveolarization and a buried angiogenesis. And so ultimately you have, have the consequence of increased pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary hyper hypertension. The true prevalence of pulmonary hypertension in BPD is unknown. Approximately 25 to 40% of infants will develop pulmonary hypertension, and these are primarily single center retrospective studies. In our 10 year experience, we've treated 46% of patients with inhaled nitric oxide and discharged a third on chronic enteral therapy. The timing of late disease development is also unknown, but likely broad. Again, single center studies with a range anywhere from two months to up to 56 weeks or seven, I'm sorry, eight, eight, seven, 80 months post, um, post birth. So a, a very large range. It contributes to morbidity and mortality in BPD. And so among, and these are data from the Children's Hospital Neonatal Consortium that BPD pH had higher rates of death before discharge, longer duration of mechanical ventilation, need for tracheostomy, discharge home on oxygen, readmissions. Mortality rates are as high as 50% by two years of age. However, in line with the fact that with good nutrition, growth, time, and support, we'll have ongoing alveolarization and lung growth, many of these infants will then be free of disease um, at approximately 60 weeks postmenstrual age. Um, I would say that for a cohort of patients that we take care of, this is often in the years after discharge, and usually around the time for those who have a tracheostomy around the time of decannulation. Um, so how do we approach mechanical ventilation if there is established pulmonary hypertension? There's no specific adjustment to our approach, which we individualize to the particular baby's physiology, but to first support the heart, support the lungs is one of our guiding principles. And so we have a typical pattern where a baby will be admitted on high level of non-invasive support and has severe pulmonary hypertension and concerns for evolving right ventricular dysfunction or even overt failure. We have a low threshold to intubate them because we know that if we don't, their right ventricle will fail. However, they often do what I call is falling off the BPD cliff. And once you, once you intubate them, they often are incredibly ill. We see this pattern in infants without pulmonary hypertension, um, where babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia can just get by for a period of time on non-invasive support. 
and then with any intercurrent events can get quite ill. We screen monthly for pulmonary hypertension with echocardiography. We don't use serum markers for screening, but do follow once there's established disease. So we follow the two compartment model concept in severe BPD to guide ventilator management. And that's that you have often multiple compartments in the lung. The healthy compartment is considered the fast compartment. This is relatively normal compliance and resistance. The injured compartment is a slow compartment with variable, variable compliance, which can be low, normal, or high. And you can see again in this CT scan how completely different, different segments of the lung are. And we also see high airway resistance. And so as a result of this physiology, you target a lower rate in severe BPD. So as a reminder of time constant and resistance time compliance, and you get complete exhalation in five time constants, and you have variable time constants throughout the lung. That's why we use SIMB with pressure support over assist control, for example, so that you have variable time constants. In the graph here on the right, you can see that there, the volume the total volume um, here is largely composed of the slow or injured compartment and then the fast compartment down here. With a ventilator eye time of 0.5, the fast compartment fills very quickly and empties very quickly and is completely empty by one second. Whereas the slow compartment takes longer to fill, but even longer to empty. And so isn't actually fully empty until three and a half seconds if you take the math of five time constants with an expiratory time constant of 0.6 you get three and so if you use a rate over 17 to 20 you risk breath stacking um, if you have breath stacking get incomplete expiratory time and contribute to auto peep you also deliver a lower proportion of tidal volume to the slow compartment and this is in contrast to respiratory distress syndrome where you have short time constants, so you use a higher rate strategy. In this disease, airway resistance is normal and compliance is low. We also optimize lung volumes. Um, compliance is the change in um, volume over change in pressure. And so here's a volume, pressure volume curve, and we follow these on the ventilators to try and determine where we are on the pressure volume curve. We want to be what's in the safe window here. And where you can see on x-ray, we're nice and open with minimal atelectasis. Most of my patients don't have an x-ray that looks like this, I will be honest. We want to avoid the zone of de-recruitment and atelectasis where the lung is not open and we have significant atelectasis. We're down here on the pressure volume curve, but also not end up in our zone of over distension where we have such significant hyperinflation that we basically are, have significant high pressures So our typical approach is volume targeted, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. There's no protocol. We individualize it to each baby's physiology and phenotype. Coming back to how are we supporting the lungs? So we start with tidal volumes approximately eight to 10 per kilo. Um, if they appear to be or more, we will certainly go higher into the 10 to 12 per kilo range and even higher if needed. It's a mean peak inspiratory pressures in the 30s to 40s are, are quite typical, um, and they often need much higher. Our rate, and I'll say here, there's some italicized because, as I said, there's no protocol. It's usually less than or equal to 20. Inspiratory trend is usually greater than or equal to 0.5. And our pressure support, we target slightly below the typical baseline pressures. So we're more attentive to the number, I'll be honest, if a patient remains to kipnic despite the total tidal volume. And what we try to avoid is the pressure support higher than the vent pressure. So you can see here, this is a patient trigger breath and brown is higher than the ventilator breath, we call that upside down. So if we see that happening, we'll then drop our pressure support. Our PEEP is not too high and not too low. And whatever the optimal PEEP is, and I'll go through that on the next few slides. And I'll say that the FiO2 often settles in the 30s to 40s for most babies. It is rare, it's possible, but it's rare to have infant need, need significantly high FiO2 for prolonged periods of time. Some frequently asked questions that I get is, is there a gestational age that we start to use the chronic settings? There aren't. It really depends on the physiology and the phenotype of the individual baby. 
Do we have a maximum PIP? No. Um, we frequently will increase our pressure limit to exceed 50 to 60, if not higher. What settings do we extubate from? Generally, it's a PEEP in the seven to eight range. We don't lean below a tidal volume of eight per kilo, assuming this is means in the mid to high 20s, sometimes low 30s, and again, FiO2s, 30s, 40s. We do use other modes, um, and it, if that is what's best for the baby's physiology, absolutely. Um, do we use steroids to extubate? It, it depends. If the PEEP is too high and we don't think we're gonna get the baby extubated during that period, we'll wait it out. If we get stuck on a PEEP of 10, then often we'll discuss and review prior exposure. We're getting infants in who have had two, three, four courses of steroids prior to even arriving to us. And they end up iatrogenically steroid, adrenally insufficient. And so we're thoughtful about ongoing steroid exposure. So a recent example of a baby that came in on their admit settings, they came to us on pressure regulated volume control a rate of 45, a tidal volume of six per kilo, a short eye time, a peep of 12, and an FiO2 of 100%. Over a period of the next 72 hours, we stood at the bedside and adjusted the settings. And, um, you know, this doesn't happen all at once. We kind of, again, look at the baby, look at the vent, um, and slowly adjust. And here's where we ended up after 72 hours, which as you can see is a rate that's half, a tidal volume that's double, pressure support that's higher, as well as the inspiratory time. And the FiO2 came down substantially with those measures. I'll use the ventilator graphics. It'll tell us an output of the um, minute ventilation. And so we'll often achieve the same minute ventilation as we, as we make these adjustments. So how high and how low on the PEEP? I think this is honestly one of the, one of the biggest challenges that we have. I'm gonna show the video on the right is a bronchoscopy of us you're really looking at the degree of airway malacia in a patient who was on a PEEP of 16 and still having intermittent episodic events. And so we were using this um, airway evaluation to try and adjust the PEEP to see if we could mitigate that collapse. We want enough PEEP so that the lung is open to recruit the lung, but we want to avoid PEEP excessive beyond what is needed, as Dr. Bangalari has described as well. And so we use the concept of matching compliance and resistance at a given PEEP to try and find what that optimal PEEP is. We use various methods to do so. In, in large airway disease, we do exactly this, which is we'll use direct visualization to say, as we go up on the PEEP, can we mitigate some of the collapse? This here is a PEEP grid um, that we can use by taking various PEEPs on the ventilator and measure the resigned the resistance and compliance output from the ventilator. I will say we don't use this to determine our PEEP, but we do use it as a general guide over a range of PEEPs, where are we? This is an abstract that we presented at the Pediatric Academic Society meeting a few years ago, which described our PEEP use in patients referred to our program. It was a retrospective review of patients over three years for infants that arrived mechanically ventilated. And we split them out into two cohorts of PEEPs that were less than or equal to 10 over greater than 11 at admission. And we looked at the changes of PEEP and FiO2 over the, over the five weeks after admission and, and various associations. The birth weight, um, the birth gestational age is very standard over the course of time for our program. And admission postmenstrual age was higher in patients with a tracheostomy, but otherwise it's pretty typical for patients to arrive to us around 43 weeks. And you can see there was a range of initial peeps. The average was ranged widely from six to 22. And over five weeks, we increased by an average of two, but we also decreased peep in a third of patients. And the increase was associated with a modest, but statistically significant decline in FiO2. In univariate analyses, peep over 11 at admission predicted discharge with a trach. And multivariable modeling, the need to escalate PEEP was associated with higher rates of trach or death. And notably, 70% of patients were discharged home with a trach. 90% of the entire cohort survived the discharge. Now, I'll say overall in our program in the last 10 years, we perform a tracheostomy in 40% of patients. But I think what we took away from these analyses were that if we have a patient that arrives in mechanically ventilated past their, past their due date, 
they are likely to end up needing a tracheostomy, but it's not an absolute. Um, and so our average postmenstrual age of trach is 53 weeks. We do take our time, but if they're coming in with a high peak, we do take that into account when making that recommendation to families. This is a way to use the ventilator to identify optimal PEEP in the large airway phenotype. So with severe tracheobronchomalacia, you can see in the upper left-hand corner, on a PEEP of 12, the patient has no patient-triggered breaths, and we're seeing obstruction of flow and expiration. On a PEEP of 14, same thing, and you're seeing it actually an inspiration and expiration. At a PEEP of 18, you start to see the patient trigger still seeing a little bit of obstruction. But at a PEEP of 24, this is kind of what you want your flow volume loop to look like, and our pressure volume form has normalized. In the upper left-hand corner, the pressure shot up all the way, and when you have the opening pressure, that's when the airways were able to open. Whereas with a higher PEEP, you were able to have um, a, a, a more ideal pressure volume curve. Now, that doesn't say that this patient was left on a PEEP of 24. Um, because again, we want to avoid excessive PEEP, but it's really a matter of identifying where, um, for large airway disease, how PEEP can help you. Now, excessive PEEP may exacerbate obstruction in the small airway phenotype, and I'll talk about that a little more. How do you identify a small airway phenotype? You can see here in the flow volume loop, the large airway is empty quickly, and then you see that the flow stops here, as you get to the smaller airways, whereas really you would like to see a nice rounded. Um, and so when we see this pattern, we note that there's small airway disease. Um, and given the degree of infants that are then responsive to bronchodilators, we'll usually at least assess a response to bronchodilators. Now, some infants with severe BPD are at risk for intrinsic or auto peep and dynamic hyperinflation. This is a consequence of a really simplification or stromal support, which contribute to the obstruction in small airway disease. I describe it as a stretched out rubber band. The alveoli just can't come back to normal at an expiration. And the consequence is auto peep, where alveolar pressure is greater than atmospheric at an expiration. You can see this in cases of large airway disease as well. And you can see this in on ventilator graphics. You can also quantify it with an expiratory hold maneuver or esophageal manometry. But this Graphic on the ventilator will show you that in the flow does not exactly return to zero before the next breath. And so if you're seeing this on the ventilator, there's some evidence that you have elevated um, alveolar pressure, which should be zero at end expiration. In this graphic here, you can see they're giving an example that the alveolar pressure is 10. And this is classic also seen actually in, in COPD as well. And so what do we see is that the patients have, we may, may have wasted breaths. So the, um, the top graphs that I showed prior where the patient wasn't able to trigger, they're trying to trigger the ventilator. They're breathing, but they're not able to trigger the ventilator. The diaphragm just can't generate enough pressure to overcome the intrinsic PEEP. And so then as you increase the ventilator PEEP, as you start to approach intrinsic PEEP, you'll start to see the baby trigger, um, but this may not be sustained. And the challenge then is you are at risk for dynamic hyperinflation, where you have an end expiratory lung volume that can't return to resting volume. When you have severe dynamic hyperinflation in these pictures, you have significantly elevated thoracic pressures, and this contributes to dysfunction of the lymphatic system. In this patient here, his intrinsic PEEP was 24. And so we did not actually try and match his intrinsic PEEP. Because what we see in this pattern is that we can match it for a period of time, but then the obstruction continues and it becomes a vicious cycle. The vicious cycle consequence is that you have such high intrathoracic pressures that you get a thoracic duct, a functional thoracic duct obstruction. And the consequence of that is severe lymphatic dysfunction, where you can see here in this patient, significant amasarca. This is dermal backflow from the lymphatic system into the skin. You can see chylus societies, pleural and pericardial effusion. This patient had a cardiac arrest and he had to emergently drain a pericardial effusion. This is an MR lymphangiogram lighting up his thoracic duct. And all of this lighting up is in his intestines is due to lymphatic leak into the intestines as well. These are patients that have severely simplified architecture 
as seen in that CT scan, where they just have very, very, very simplified alveoli. And so identifying optimal PEEP in these patients with dynamic hyperinflation is a huge challenge. You can have too little and you can have too much. In large airway disease, higher PEEP absolutely can have, help you and too little PEEP can add to dynamic hyperinflation. It's a, it's a consequence of needing that critical opening pressure to then allow expiratory flow to occur. However, in diffuse small airway disease, higher PEEP may decrease. So if you have diffuse small airway disease, PEEP actually may help stent open those floppy airways and then decrease your alveolar pressure. However, they can also fully further elevate alveolar pressure. And we really do need better technology to help us identify optimal PEEP in these patients. Complementary strategies that we use depending on the phenotype include inhaled nitric oxide to alleviate VQ mismatch. This may be in patients without any established um, pulmonary hypertension on echocardiography. We use bronchodilators in small airway disease. Other inhaled therapies to improve airway clearance. These children are at higher risk for really smoldering lower respiratory tract infections. We use targeted use of diuretics, prone positioning. We'll see this in patients that come in when we get a CT scan. You'll see posteriorly they're entirely atelectatic. And this is due to the fact that they've spent most of their time on their backs. So we really carefully try and do periods of prone positioning to try and recruit those posterior segments. We do use cuffed endotracheal tubes at times, not universally to mitigate leak. And then as I alluded to, if long-term positive pressure is anticipated, we recommend tracheostomy. Our average time is 53 weeks corrected, and we perform a tracheostomy in 40% of our patients. This is a huge ask for our families, which we acknowledge. And in the, in, in the face of the pandemic, there's significant shortages of, of home nursing. And so it's one that we take very seriously. Um, but is necessary to support the long-term lung health of our patients who really will need months, if not years, of mechanical ventilation. Um, none of this will be possible without the input and guidance from the multidisciplinary members of our team, which is comprised of bedside nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, respiratory therapy, a whole multidisciplinary group of physicians who come together each week to think through the complicated physiology of these patients. This top photo here is Yan Zhang, who started the program in 2010 and really has had an incredible vision for it. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak today, and I will return after hearing Dr. Bankalari's next excellent talk to answer any questions. <laughs>